All right, today we got a call on a fire alarm system that's giving them a uh, trouble condition. Now, when I got here, the customer wasn't completely aware as to which unit I was here for. And I tried calling the alarm company and they were no help. Um, they outsource their call centers to a place where they don't speak fluent English. And it's a little frustrating to, to talk to them because I don't even understand what the people are saying. So before I go any further with that, we're just gonna come up onto this roof and we're gonna start going through the units to see which one is potentially a problem. Maybe we'll get lucky and find something simple. Um, I don't even know if it was a fire condition or a trouble condition. I have no idea, okay? So we're gonna open these units up real quick and uh, figure out which one's the problem. All right, we narrowed it. Well, we think the problem is with this unit because it has no power going to it right now, or at least the display on the board is blank. There's no LED lights. So we're gonna start by checking power right here, okay? The disconnect switch is on, but we're gonna check to see if we actually have power here. All right, from phase one to three, nothing. Two to three, nothing. One to two, nothing. And then let's check the ground real quick just to make sure there's nothing funky going on. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Okay, so we have no power, yet when we come over here, our disconnect switch is on. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and turn that off, um, even though it's on, and we're gonna start by checking for direct shorts to ground because the idea is that maybe the breakers tripped or something downstairs. Also, uh, it's probably, I shouldn't say if you guys recognize this unit, because you probably don't, I work on these things all the time, you probably wouldn't know exactly which one I'm on, but about six months ago, I had a service call where we had, I think it was a refrigerant leak and we had to change the dryers like multiple times and I ended up having to go with a 30 cubic inch dryer. This is that same unit. Supposedly they were supposed to order a new unit and it was supposed to be here, be, start being built mid November. Well, here we are December 7th now of 2021 and we've yet to see a unit. Uh, we had disconnected one of the compressors last time because it was grounded out. I bet you anything, this is the one that had that nasty oil, I bet you anything we have another unit that has a grounded compressor would be my thought. So we're gonna check for direct shorts to ground real quick and then we'll go from there. So we're starting on the load side of every contactor to see if we have any direct shorts to ground. I've got my meter on continuity or, or tone and it's gonna give resistance too, so keep going down the line. We're checking, there it is right there. We're gonna keep going. Okay, so this contactor right here, we have a direct short to ground on the number three leg, all right? So first we wanna see if it's something that's possibly shorted, the wires were rubbing up against there. Let's go ahead and disconnect this plug. Even though there's no power here, you still wanna be careful disconnecting these plugs, especially if you have, yeah, this thing's not coming out. So there's a very good possibility when I pull that, we can pull one of the terminals out. So you wanna put yourself out of harm's way when you're doing this. Okay, so now we're gonna check each leg to ground to see if we get a direct short. Nothing, nothing. Oh, that's interesting, keep going, do it again. Make sure we got a good ground source, there you go. There you are. So, okay, let's do that again. Put it back down here. This just goes to show that sometimes you could have a bad ground. See, because it, 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 you scratched it now, but sometimes you can have a bad ground, so you always wanna make sure you're on a good ground source. The best thing to do would be to test to a known ground source. So put this right here, then test it to the copper. That confirms that you have a good ground. See, that's not a good ground. There you go, see how you had to scratch it. So it's always good to test that, but we have a grounded compressor right here on one of the legs, actually. I don't know which one it is. It looks like, yeah, it doesn't really matter, but we have a grounded compressor. So let's see if the third stage compressor is still good. So let's go ahead and test that one one more time, make sure we have a good ground. Okay, so. We're good on that. Now um, we're gonna go ahead and uh, open this guy up. We're gonna see if the refrigerant's burnt. We'll tape this one off at a minimum. All right, nothing else is shorted, but what's interesting is we went ahead and opened up this contactor right in here. 
and look at those terminals man look at and this blue wire is actually the one that's shorted we traced it all the way back here and look at the bottom of that like it's just caked in there and that contactor's just done that's crazy so um we need to probably disconnect this so that way we don't get any more shorts because even though it's barely making contact it can still cause high current and maybe cause a breaker trip so we'll disconnect that and then uh try to turn the unit back on we'll have to go downstairs and see if there's a trip breaker too i'm assuming there is so this is our main breaker right here and we actually have a tripped breaker so because it's in the trip position you have to turn it off then back on but remember we had shut off the disconnect switch on the roof so we can safely turn this on now we'll go back up there and figure out what's up up there all right so we should be safe let's see what happens one two three please don't blow up and i'm standing off to the side initial startup that's just because of my camera it's not flashing like that 12 is high pressure for compressor one because instead of disconnecting the contactor all that I did was disconnect the pressure control so that way it doesn't even try to pull in the contactor so 12 is gonna be a normal error code so now they have two compressors down they might still have one compressor I don't know Let's go ahead and turn it on and see what happens. So, shift, unit test, should say CO1, change it to C11, hold it down, decimal appears, stand back. And that compressor's on its way out too, sounds like junk. Let's go ahead and do a voltage drop test across the contactor and see what it looks like. Nothing, okay. Nothing. Nothing. Now check three phase on the top. One to three. Okay. Two to three. Okay. One to two. Now check the bottom. Okay. Okay. All right. So the compressor is running. It sounds horrible uh, because the oil's probably descend or destroyed inside that compressor because of the dirty condenser, the lack of preventative maintenance, just like the problems we ran into before when I did all the dryers and everything. Um, condenser fan motors are running. It is gonna cycle the other two. Uh, we'll go ahead and pull this panel off real quick and get a look in here. And this may bring back a bell, but what I did was I put in isolation valves so we can change the dryer on the fly because it kept plugging up. This one has a 30 cubic inch dryer. This is the one that's still running. This one is dead and this one is dead now. So only this one is running. It's a flare dryer in case we needed to replace it again. But, and this is the third, because you can tell that it splits off. So it shares half the bottom condenser. So lack of preventative maintenance, that's what's causing this stuff. So, all right, we'll put that back on. And then uh, we're just gonna talk to the customer, see where they want us to go with this. There's not much I can do. And if they wanted to fix it, the only way I would fix it is if we put in three new compressors, TXVs completely uh, flush the system out with nitrogen, purging it, you know, scrubbing it, all that good stuff. Indoor blowers running, belt is tight, I can tell. I mean, there's not much more we can do. Filters look like they were just replaced, so they're clean. Yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all we can do on this one, so close it up and uh, we'll take down all the information, give the customer the bad news which they kind of already knew and i have a feeling they probably canceled the order for the new unit because this was ordered all the way back in like may or june and uh it's now december and we've yet to hear anything so i bet you they canceled it it's probably not going to do too much but we shut the unit off real quick and we're going to go ahead and replace this third contactor because it's pretty pitted out even though we didn't have a voltage drop across it we don't want it to do the same thing that this one did once it starts getting really hot so we've got a new contactor right here. We're gonna switch it out and then turn the unit back on and give it back to them. All right, we are back in action. It's still gonna sound like junk, but we got the new contactor in there. That way maybe we'll get a little more life out of the unit. 
this contactor is just those points are just dead that and the oil in that thing is just trash too so all right well they have a unit we're going to contact them and see where they want to go with this uh let's hope that they still have the other unit on order because if they ask me to fix this they're getting three new compressors three txvs um a massive repair on this unit that i don't think it is worth this kitchen ac is something special um, I've done a lot of work on this one. This one, I put ball valves on the dryers because we had to get it going temporarily because they kept plugging them up. This compressor is extremely loud. And these two compressors are grounded. So, talked to the customer a long time ago. They ordered a new unit. Long story short, they got a quote, but they never approved it. So then uh, COVID happened and it was just sitting there and at that time they only had one compressor bad and then i told them the third was going bad and they said yeah or i actually told them the second and third were going bad and they ordered a new unit well at least they thought they did come time for the unit to be delivered i'm like hey where's this unit apparently they never uh said okay so they had to get back in line again and then they were told another eight months well it is now may of 2022 and the estimated delivery time is gonna be August of 2022. And I talked to the customer and corporate and all that stuff, and I'm like, guys. Then they started complaining about a water leak. Okay, so if we go right here, they're like, hey, they've got water pouring down in the ductwork. Well, what's happening is uh, the only compressor that's working is the top, the top of the evaporator right there. So the water condensates, drips down, and then the rest of the coil, the, the, the bottom two thirds is dry. So the air sucks off the coil and gets down in the building. So now they have water leaks because they've only got one compressor that is operating. So I talked to the customer and they went ahead and approved me to go ahead and put in two new compressors. Now both of these are grounded right here. And they know that they're still tentatively getting a new unit in uh, August, but they just need cooling basically and they can't deal with the water leak anymore either so we're going to uh, um, put the two new compressors in here we're gonna do the minimum repair possible because they don't want to spend any more money than they have to but still gonna have to do suction dryers new TXV all that and the funny thing is as I walk up you see all this this is because they called the roofer out here and he couldn't figure out where the water leaks were coming at so he just starts sealing everything around this unit oh it might be that oh it might be that Look at all around this unit is all sealed. But look at look at my whole unit's covered in roofing stuff because it's trying to solve the problem. And then finally the roofer couldn't fix it, so they called us and we're like, oh, that's because uh, it's leaking from the coil. Like, I don't know. About a week ago, I had someone come out here and recover the charge. It was both of these compressors are grounded, so we have no refrigerant in either of these compressors. There's still refrigerant in that one, we're leaving that one alone. That's also why there's two compressors just sitting on the roof. We brought those up. So we don't have to worry about recovering. Um, let's see, what I did, if you open up the installation manuals and stuff on these Linux units, they give you diagrams so you can tell which condenser fan motors are which. And then also, looking at the condenser, the top of this is circuit one, the top of this is circuit two, and then the bottom is circuit three. So this is circuit one. We'll probably eliminate the 3 8 dryer because we do have a high burn or a bad burn. So we're gonna go with the HH core. Now the HH core on the Sporlin dryers is actually not high acid. For the longest time I thought it was and I was incorrect. HH is high wax removal, okay? A standard Sporlin catch-all filter dryer has perfect acid removal. It, it's built into the desiccant, it removes acid. But if you have wax from a nasty burn and the wax comes from when the windings when the refrigerant or the oil gets acidic it starts eating away at the the wax plastic coating on the windings and that's what the hh core is for to help clean up the wax now it also has acid removal too but anyways we're going to go with hh dryer on this one we'll eliminate the flares uh, this is our other dryer we're going to be changing so we'll go with HH dryer on that. This one we'll leave alone because this is our third stage. So we'll just leave that one be. But the last time I kept plugging up the dryers and uh, it was because uh, 
Well, I, anyways, I put these ball valves on just because it was temporary and it just kept happening. So we'll do that. But again, those are already recovered. I'll also have someone clean this condenser. The reason why these compressors are going bad in more than likely the high acid situation is because the customer doesn't do routine preventative maintenance and these condensers only get cleaned once or twice a year properly by me. They have a filter changing company come out and they clean condensers, but they don't take them apart like this. So we'll definitely have someone. I'm actually gonna have three people here today, myself and two other guys. Uh, one guy's bringing me a bunch of TXVs and some dryers. So I'll have him cleaning condensers and myself and my other tech that are here right now will start unsweating and brazing in these new compressors. It's kind of crazy that they're doing all this work, but hey, they need cooling and they gotta get this water leak stopped. We're making the best of our time here. So I have someone going around sanding compressors, getting them ready. We're getting ready to do that. We've sanded the dryers nice and good. I got this one removed because there's no gas still. Um, it's really nice when you have these small imps, tubing cutters. They call them an imp for some reason. But, um, it, you know, imp may come from Imperial because Imperial used to make tubing cutters. But it's just like a generic term these days. Um, but it's really nice when you have these small ones because they can get up in tight places. Like you can see it barely clears, but it's nice without having to bend stuff out of the way. Now I have all different sizes. This one just happens to be a JB one, but it's just what the supply house had. I honestly, my favorites used to be the yellow jacket or the Richie ones, but most supply houses don't really carry those anymore. A lot of places are getting rid of Richie or yellow jacket and they're going to JB um, or some other brand. But so that's just should be just some residual pressure that's in the system. Um, yeah, hopefully it doesn't blow in my face. But yeah, so that's that. We're gonna get those cut out and then these unsweat. So we're currently over here too, getting these uh, TXVs all sanded up. So back here, we've got two TXVs and because these are nasty burns, I did have a technician go get two new TXVs. So by taking the TXVs out, It'll give us the ability to purge the system with nitrogen. So we'll be able to blow out just the condenser coil. Then we'll be able to blow out just the suction lines and, and all the way through. And that's the way that I deal with acid because I typically don't use any neutralizers or additives in my systems whenever possible. All right, I'm currently mocking up the dryers. Now we're not gonna braze anything in yet. I'm still waiting for someone to bring me another liquid dryer, but still, I'm just getting them ready and making the fittings because I had to make adapters, okay? And I swaged it right here. Um, and then I'm gonna get this one ready and figure out what I need because we still have to sweep the line with nitrogen and blow everything out. I also, uh, we're still working on getting the new compressors in. We have the old compressors out. And then uh, I went ahead and unsweat the TXVs also. They're sitting right here. So that way we can purge the system and sweep all, you know, any potential contaminants out. That's the hopes. back and forth motion like this. That was pretty nasty. So there's a significant amount of oil, but it's definitely short from the 66 ounces that it should have. So, we probably poured, I don't know, three, four ounces out of these P-traps that we pulled out of the suction line. They were both full of oil. And I'm sure we'll get some out of the condenser and the evaporator. We're gonna do the same test for this guy right here. See how much is in that one too. The second one, the oil was not as dirty. All that nasty black colors from that first compressor. The second one had 51 ounces in it. So that's pretty good. Um, but we're still gonna blow out the condenser and the evaporator, try to get as much as we can out. All right, we're giving it bursts from the discharge line over, and then it's coming out right here. So far there's no oil, but I have a towel in case there was. But you just do bursts like that, put your finger over it, but there's vapor coming out. And then we'll do the opposite way, and then we'll keep doing that for the suction line and everything. All the lines we're gonna blow out. 
We're kind of getting everything mocked up. We got the dryer mocked up. What I'm doing though is I'm making the bottom braze joint outside. I marked it, put some of the Viper wet rag on the dryer. So we're using a Sporlin uh, suction line filter dryer with an HH core, so a 307 SHH. And uh, we're, like I said, we're gonna get it brazed up right there so that way we don't have to do an upside down braze joint. And then that one we mocked up, we'll pull that one apart too. We went ahead and cleaned the condensers inside and out. I had someone do actually all of them. Um, we just finished on this one, so this one's nice and good. It's not like shiny out here, but it doesn't need to be. It's really just, you know, we're not looking for shiny, we're looking for clean. So we got that all cleaned up. The expansion valves are both brazed in. We gotta put the sensing bulbs on. And then uh, what I'm gonna do now, the compressor and everything's done. We're all brazed in on everything, so I'm gonna get vacuum pumps running on this guy now start evacuating the two. We're currently doing electrical. The new compressors, the old ones had Molex plugs, the new ones did not, so we had to use uh, special fittings, use the flag connector adapters, and we'll heat shrink these, because these are heat shrink fittings. So we'll heat them up, boom, melt them, tape them, and we're just slowly putting everything together, but now we're gonna get the evacuation stuff going. We're running out of nitrogen, but we were able to uh, get 102 PSI in this one, 101 right in there, okay, and then this one, we were only able to get to about 82 PSI, but we're currently doing a standing pressure test using the S-Man 480V. Um, we don't have the suction line temperature clamps, which would help you do temperature compensated, but we're just kind of wrapping things up. We're just taking things down. Some people are going downstairs to get vacuum pumps and stuff right now. We went ahead and changed both of these contactors because they were both in really bad shape. This one's burnt inside really bad, and so is the other one can't really see but it's really bad so we got those taken care of um, yeah pressure test and then we're gonna do the uh, evacuation all right 17 minutes no change oh, 0.2 so yeah it's barely even moving this one right here 0.3 15 minutes I'm, I'm good with this we're gonna call this good we're gonna let the nitrogen out and then get all the vacuum pumps and everything hooked up and running on this guy now we did mess with things um, and we could have wired the compressors backwards. So what I did was I disconnected all the compressors and that way I can push in the contactor. Now we can't do this one yet because this one's still in a vacuum, but this one right here has got about eight pounds of gas in it. So I can go ahead and shut down the high side. It's about 10 now and uh, push this guy in and listen to it and see what it sounds like. That sounds good. It's not running backwards. We're actually moving refrigerant like we should be. So we're still low, but we're gonna add some refrigerant to that one. 
Um, now I need to get gas in this one before we start trying to uh, test the rotation on that one. But with this being said, I can go ahead and plug this guy in because um, I unplugged the high pressure control back here. So I can plug it back in and then we can finish charging this one. At this point, <laughs> we had that compressor running and it's making a god awful sound. So we turned it off for now. The damn thing sounded like it was gonna blow up. So we're gonna let that cool down. We'll see if we can turn it back on. I don't know if it was just getting a slug of oil or what, but it was sounding like it was gonna blow up. Lots of knocking. It wasn't popping though. It wasn't like it was electrically popping inside, but it was knocking like, like metal on metal or something. Um, so we're working on the first two. So we got about 10 pounds of gas in both of them. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and charge accordingly. So we're using the Joblink app. Right now we're running about one degree subcooling on that one, about two degrees subcooling on this one. And that's actual subcooling because we're checking it up there. So we're gonna get that to about 10 degrees. So we're gonna add a little, uh, we're doing 407C for these two. So we're gonna add some 407C and see how that does for us. So we're getting there, a little bit out of time, 4.4 degrees. I do have to say that with the, the large Joblink clamp, the JL3LC, it makes it really nice because it fits on seven eighths uh, up to like four inches, I think. Uh, it goes big, super big. So it's really nice on these bigger lines. So we've got it on all three right now. Now we don't have the third running at the moment, but I will turn it back on in a minute. But yeah, it really does make it nice to be able to clamp onto that stuff. Cause sometimes, now on seven eighths, you know, the normal Joblink clamp would work. But anything bigger than seven eighths, it starts to become a problem. When you get up to inch and an eighth, inch and five eighths, it starts to struggle. And that's where the JL3LC really, really shines. But um, yeah, we're doing good. So we are just about, we've added another 14 ounces and I stopped at like 10 pounds. So we're like right almost to the 11 pounds. And I'm just giving it a minute. We're currently at four degrees sub cooling. Um, it's about 78 degrees outside. So we're doing pretty good on that one so far. The TD is definitely low, but that's because we only have the two compressors running at the moment. So we're gonna keep going on this guy, get that sub cooling a little bit higher. I'm looking to be closer to 10 degrees. And then uh, we'll jump on the second stage and get that one charged up. But you can see the TXV is doing a good job now that I got a little more refrigerant in there. It's really regulating the superheat. Now this one still needs refrigerant and that TXV is struggling to maintain superheat because we have such a low sub cooling. So the higher we go, the better it's gonna get. I don't think I'm gonna put any more gas in here. I've already gone over the nameplate charge like by a couple ounces and I'm not loving that. So I got it as high as about 7.3, 7.1 degrees sub cooling. Um, superheat's, you know, doing its thing. The TXV is opening and closing, so that's fine. Um, it's just about 20 something degrees over ambient temperature because it's just about 75-ish degrees right now. This one's running higher and I expect it to because that condenser is jacked up on the top. So that one's gonna run higher head pressure. The simple fact of if we have any subcooling, we have a solid column of liquid going to the expansion valve, okay? The extra subcooling is just there for uh, ambient conditions and high and low load in different situations. So, you know, we don't know what we really should charge because Linux doesn't publish subcooling data. Typically with the R22 systems, if you're reading discharge pressure, you run about 15 degrees subcooling, 11, 12 degrees subcooling with liquid pressure. But I'm not feeling comfortable putting very much more gas in this, maybe a couple more ounces. Granted, we do, we did add a suction line filter dryer, so that adds extra capacity essentially but other than that I mean I put a 16 cubic inch dryer it's a little bit bigger than an 8 cubic inch but I'm very reluctant to keep adding gas to this guy I, I think I'm gonna leave this there um, and uh, we're gonna turn on that third one and see if the damn thing blows up all right let's see if this thing blows up I'm gonna step back because the I, I think the scroll set was hitting something on the top or something like that but could have just been oil coming back or something like that. Let's see. Decimal place. Let's see if it starts doing it. All right, it's running. It's not doing it right now. It was a loud knocking sound. It's kind of making a funny sound. Suction pressure, I mean, it's got refrigerant pressures, but they're kind of dragging. 
we didn't reverse the rotation or anything like that. Yeah, that guy, I'm looking at it right now. Those pressures are kind of funky. Let's bring this over here where we can safely be out of the way. So this guy, 82 suction, let's give it a minute. Eh, it's building. It's building. Eight degrees subcooling, eight degrees subcooling, superheat on those first two is fine. This guy's struggling now. Well, I mean, it's got decent super heat, <laughs> but that head pressure's low. Oh, well, you know, I just thought about something right now. Um, Cause I was wondering why our outdoor ambient temperature is like 78, 75 degrees, somewhere in there, right? 88, 98. And I was usually, you know, a rule of thumb is 25, 30 degrees over ambient on the old 10 seer equipment. But this is actually liquid pressure. This isn't discharge pressure. So it wouldn't necessarily be 30 degrees over ambient. Um, so it might be right where it's at. So those are running. There's my TD, my TD came back. 18, 19 degree TD because I got that third stage running now. Head pressure's low though. That was interesting. It was very interesting. Let's give it some time, we'll let it run for a bit. This guy is not making that sound anymore, so I don't doubt that that compressor's gonna take a dump. It's, it's really loud. You can hear it. And earlier it was like bah, 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 and like popping, but it wasn't like an electrical pop. It was like metal on metal scroll plates or something. Who knows? But like I said, I think maybe it was getting oil returning or something like that and I didn't like it. Um, but this guy's running. I, there's not much more we can do. Again, they're replacing this unit. So we're polishing a turd, right? First and second stage compressors, suction line filter dryers on both HH cores, liquid line filter dryers on both HH cores, new compressor contactor one and two, um, I tested all the condenser fan motors they're working. We replaced the first and second stage TXVs. Um, this uh, third stage compressor is running low head pressure. Um, Subcooling, I mean lower than what I'd expect it to be head pressure. Subcooling's kinda low. Superheat, the TXV's doing its job. I mean, it's not gonna get much better than this. Again, 19 degree unit TD. 170,000 BTU output. Seems a little bit low, but not horrendous. Yeah, that's all we're gonna do on this one. So uh, we are gonna wrap up the last of our stuff and uh, we're gonna give the customer the keys and hopefully this will last them until tentatively August when we get a new package unit. Let's see if that actually happens though. Now, this is only one compressor, but I predict them both to be about the same. Okay, number one, look at the top of the muffler plate extremely overheated it's very thick the oil there's like oil residue up here it's just beat down okay up in here you can see the discoloration from the high temperatures inside this compressor look inside the scroll plates they're very discolored what little oil there is in there is very thick and it looks like it has a lot of contaminants in it, okay? I haven't popped the floating seal off yet, but I wanted you guys to see as I was taking this apart, I had to dis, you know, cut a lot of things, but first off, look at that. There's a O-ring sitting in the bottom of the compressor. That's interesting. How in the heck did an O-ring make it through the system into the compressor? Very interesting, okay? Look in the bottom of that. Look at, look at that. Look at how thick that oil is. It's nasty. Now, uh, look at, you got a little bit of copper plating up in here. This thing's very, very dirty. It obviously had electrical shorts. Um, I will say the old ham coupling was completely broken, okay? So this guy was really struggling. But check this out when you flip this over. Look at the buildup inside of that. That's like where the oil travels, right? It sits in the bottom of the sump. It's got little pieces in there that pick it up. And when it's spinning, it shoots the oil up through the top of the compressor. It's com the oil is completely contaminated and it's like goo. 
inside of there, okay? So I'm gonna call this guy catastrophic failure, oil loss, old ham coupling broke, shorted, direct short, look at the top of that, nasty. And I'm gonna say obviously both of them are gonna be because of lack of preventative maintenance. This one is just as bad. Look at the bottom of this, look at that oil. And look at how it completely, like the acidic oil it looks like started to deteriorate this thing. Like look at the bottom of that, that is just insane. But the oil in this is just trash. This one doesn't have as much buildup as the last one in there, but it's thick. This stuff is just nasty. Busted old ham coupling, same thing. This one's going to be an overheat, just like the other one that just led to a catastrophic failure. Um, remember, one of these almost had the full oil charge in it. The other one was a little over half the oil charge. Um, I did my best to blow out the evaporator and condenser and the lines, and I did get some oil out. But I think a lot of this actually, like, I think that's oil that just turned into something. Like, that's bad. Look at that. Just completely deteriorated that. that. I can, like, push my finger through that. And that's like a hard plastic. Had some copper plating going on in here. But this thing is just done. Yeah. That AC is just done. So the original service call that you guys saw was in December. I made the repair for changing the compressors uh, at the end of May of 2022, and we still haven't gotten a new AC. The previous service call where I bypassed all the dryers or uh, replaced a bunch of dryers and got it working was like six months, eight months ago before that. So again, like I said in the video, the customer approved a replacement unit they buy them themselves but they never signed off on the final paperwork so when the six month time frame came up of when they said they were going to deliver the package unit i started emailing and i'm like hey where's the unit and they're like oh it never got approved so then they had to get back in line and then it was going to be like another six to eight months and it looks like it's going to be longer than that so crazy i reached out to the customer and i'm like these guys are dying right now they had a water leak because that top stage was running and i wanted to address that too so you have a slab coil, right? You got three stages. The third stage is the very top of the coil. The second stage is the middle of the coil. The first stage is the bottom of the coil. When the first and the second stage aren't working, what happens is you get natural condensation, right? And the condensation runs down the coil and, and it kind of sticks to the coil because there's a lot of moisture there. But then when it gets to the second stage, that coil's dry. So that condensation doesn't do a good job of sticking to the coil and the air moving through the evaporator coil pulls the condensation right off the coil and it drips downstairs into the occupied space and it drives the customers nuts. This is especially something that can happen on the old school carrier package units that had a slab coil that was at a slant, right? And that slant, the coil would hang over the return air. And you would get that a lot if the first stage stopped working. The second stage would start dripping, and then it would just go straight down into the ductwork. In this case, even if you have a, a vertical up and down slab coil, it can still happen. And that's what was happening on this guy. And then the, it looks like the roofer just went nuts trying to solve the problem until he couldn't find it anymore, and he told him to call the HVAC guy. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that every roofer out there is bad. I know there's some really good roofers. I know I have roofers that watch this channel, and I know there's quality roofers out there, but there's also really bad roofers, just like there's really bad HVACR service technicians too, okay? So, you know, not everybody knows what they're doing. I'm sure the, the shortage of employees has a lot to do with it. They're probably sending people out that aren't necessarily qualified. I couldn't believe that mat that he sealed down that, that I don't know if I really addressed it in the video, but there was a mat on the ground and that mat was a high traffic mat for someone to step on they put it like in front of the condenser coil so you can stand on it when you're cleaning and he straight sealed the high traffic mat down and it's like dude why not just lift it up and if there was a leak underneath it just seal the leak like i don't know but went through it did my best that i could okay um i personally don't use additives uh, I like just pushing nitrogen through the system. I was brazing with nitrogen the entire time, but before I braze the compressor, the dryers, or the TXVs back in, we purged the system with nitrogen in all different directions while building pressure, and we did blow oil out of the evaporator coil. We blew oil out of the condenser coil, um, and that should account for some of the oil loss. The other oil loss, in all honesty, I think is just turned into sludge in the bottom of the compressor. It was super thick. So... 
This is exactly what happens when they don't maintain their equipment and they run high discharge temperatures for extended periods of time. It just starts to destroy the inside of the compressor, okay? Now, what physically caused this compressor to go bad? Obviously, there was a direct short, right? The old ham coupling, I believe, broke and then wedged itself between the windings and it shorted it out. But what led to that is the question, okay? Um, I'm sure we had some flooded starts on this one. I'm sure we had an overheat situation where the oil wasn't lubricating. You saw the bottom of that crankshaft just full of like goo, okay? So lubrication wasn't happening properly. Inevitably, it really falls down to improper preventative maintenance and the lack thereof that caused these compressors to fail, okay? So it's so important that the customer maintain their equipment or this is what can happen. And then you add you know, supply chain shortages and then they're throwing in compressors into a unit that they're gonna replace supposedly in a couple months. Kind of crazy, but hey, I'm just there to do what I, I'm told, right? And at the same time, the customer said minimum repair possible, but there's only some so many things I'm gonna do uh, cut corners on. I'm still gonna change the expansion valve. Why? Why change the expansion valve on a grounded out compressor? Well. There's no way to isolate the system. So once you charge the system with the 11 pounds of gas that it takes, and then you find out the expansion valve is bad, man, that stinks, right? Or you can just change a valve when you have all the refrigerant out. You're better off. Plus, it gave me the opportunity to purge through the system with nitrogen. I had to pull the expansion valve anyways out to be able to blow all the oil and nastiness out of the system. So you might as well change it when you're there. I'm not really in the business to unsweat an expansion valve to sweat it back in. It just seems a little odd to me, okay? So we did our best. We even changed the contactors. It was working as best as possible, okay? Um, we just can only do what the customer allows us to do, right? But then again, we always want to do our best, okay? We're not perfect technicians. We just try our best, all right? Remember, I talk about this a lot lately, and I'm going to say it again. There's so much craziness going on in the world right now. You do not know what the next guy is going through. I'm not justifying the next guy being a jerk, but have patience, okay? Just because someone's being rude to you, I'm not justifying and saying that it's okay for them to be rude, but at the same time, you have no idea what they're going through, okay? Let things go. You don't have to be so critical. You don't have to be so angry. I'm saying these things to you because I need to hear these things too, okay? I struggle with this. I said on my last video too, take time. You never know when, it, when, when you know, the last time you're going to be able to talk to someone is either, okay? So make sure you spend the time you need to spend with your loved ones. Don't put it off, okay? Um, covet them and, uh, you know, just, just take the time, tell them you love them. Don't, don't be afraid. Okay. Cause you never know when someone's time is going to end. It's just crazy these days. Okay. So spend that time with the loved ones, prioritize the most important things in your life, which is your family and yourself, right? Work comes after your family and after yourself in my book. Okay. And again, I'm saying these things to you because I need to hear them too. All right. I really appreciate all the support. It is so amazing. It is so humbling to see the comments, the emails. Um, it is just awesome. So thank you so very much. Be kind to one another, and uh, we will catch you on the next one, okay?